So to, to continue the physio show, um, uh, as this is, so um, just before coffee, it's a pleasure to uh, invite Rebecca to come to talk, uh, who uh, is also um, a lead physiotherapist. She's going to be talking to rehabilitation, uh, also a respiratory physician, and also on Jim Hull's BPAP paper, I noted. Uh, good afternoon. So I guess I'm coming to this talk with two hats on a little bit like Mel was earlier, um, both as a clinical lead physio at UCLH in their post-COVID service, uh, but also as a regional specialty advisor for NHS England uh, on non-COVID as well. Uh, and my experience is not particularly in POTS. I'm going to talk to you about my experience of non-COVID. Um, and so you've seen this van many times before, it's something that's going to stick in all of our minds when we uh, look back over our careers. But um, we opened our post-COVID service uh, in um, May 2020, so really near the beginning, and we've seen a lot of patients through our clinic. Um, so I'm going to be bringing to this talk my experience of having seen people through that clinic. So we've seen over 4,000 patients through the doors so far. And I'm bringing my expertise uh, in breathing pattern retraining as well. Uh, and I've got some answers to the questions about resources that I can uh, add in at the end as well. Um, also, my experience setting up and now co-chairing a uh, long COVID network of allied health and therapy clinicians, uh, which is regional, but gets national attendance as well. And we have about 500 people on our distribution list. So hopefully I'm also bringing the experience that I have learned from all of them as well to this. Um, and then lastly, as my, um, with my sort of regional specialty advisor hat on doing peer reviews at services and feeding into um it, to work that's been coming out so here as a disclaimer uh, in terms of conflicts having fed into the commission and guidance that's going to be coming out soon and the who um guidance is also coming out hopefully within the next month so 15 minutes to talk about rehabilitation uh, in long COVID, <laughs> uh, just to hone it down to three key messages, which you have already heard uh, this afternoon. So the first is about assessment and that being good and that being essential to your rehab rehabilitation plan, it being personalised to the person that is in front of you and it being multifaceted. And we're just going to talk a little bit about each of those things. So again, I don't know whether Toby shared this slide this morning because I've completely stolen it from him. Uh, but when we started our assessment clinic, we really thought that we'd see lots of people, we'd do lots of tests and they'd fit nice and neatly into boxes and then we'd send them to different services depending on what they needed. The reality of that was far, far different. Um, so the assessment is really important because as well as ruling out your red flags uh, and the World Physiotherapy Briefing paper that came out identifies kind of four key red flags for you to be looking for for rehabilitation. So cardiac impairment, exertional desaturation, post-exertional symptom exacerbation and dysautonomia as four things that you want to really look for in your assessment. Um, you also want to understand the patient in front of you. What is their their most important problem and we'll talk about personalized care in a minute um, but then once you have done your assessment and you can understand those problems then you can choose what your rehabilitation approach is going to be and I'm just going to quickly mention here post-exertional symptom exacerbation because it was a term that was fairly new to me when I came to working with people with post-covid syndrome or long covid and it's really quite important for how we frame our rehabilitation so this is a, a symptom or a cluster of symptoms uh, that will develop after exertion and that's not exertion as you might have thought you know in your pre-covid self that's not like going for a run for somebody post-covid that could literally be having a shower uh, or making a meal and it can cause a flare of symptoms um, and that can be anything from feeling fatigue or headache or palpitations uh, and so understanding if that's a feature for your patient is really quite important in terms of your rehabilitation approach and there are different types of exertion as well it's not just physical effort that could cause that but it's also cognitive efforts if you're having to concentrate for a long period of time or it can also be emotional effort so if you're in a very stressful situation that's also going to drain your body battery and can be leading to a post-exertional symptom exacerbation so assessment for your rehabilitation is key and then that brings us on to personalization so personalized care is really important there are patterns in how people present um, and there are different phenotypes we think you saw that lovely side from mel before with all the circles on uh, so we you know there are different phenotypes however there's so much to get through when you're assessing a patient and when you're doing your rehabilitation that the most important thing you can ask them is about what matters to them and what's important to them. What is the thing that is that is most problematic for you that we can help with? And that's your starting point. Um, so we need to think about the whole person. 
And we need to then tailor the rehab offer to fit them rather than trying to fit them to the rehab offers that we have. You want to be thinking about holistic rehab, so health in all domains, so physical, financial, social, environmental, spiritual, psychological health, and using goals as well to help uh, frame your pathway. And your rehab offer needs to be multifaceted. So initially, when we were seeing people with lots of different symptoms, we would send them to different experts and to different services to get the input that they need. And as you heard earlier from Harsha and from Mel, what you end up with is a patient who's getting conflicting information uh, and it's not coordinated. At the same time, we know there are workforce shortages and we've got massive waiting lists. And so one of our roles as rehabilitation clinicians is to be upskilling, to be able to provide kind of versatile interventions for our patients. So in an ideal world, you would be offering a multifaceted rehab approach for your patients. So picking the things that they need and delivering those together. And it may be that once you've delivered kind of your tier one basic treatment, then you need to seek help from an expert. But that's where your MDTs are really valuable. You don't need to add them to somebody else's waiting list necessarily. You can coordinate that care. And sometimes people will need to go and see a separate specialist for, for something. But we should be trying as much as possible to be providing kind of a one-stop multifaceted approach. So <laughs> to exercise or not to exercise with long COVID, it's a really controversial question. Um, so for me, this really depends on whether they have exercise intolerance um, and what you're trying to achieve by doing the exercise, because exercise is a really broad term that encompasses a whole lot of things. Um, and what we hear from patients is if they have exercise intolerance, they have this post-exertional symptom exacerbation, Cardiovascular exercise causes a massive crash and flare in symptoms and they struggle. And the thing that's really tricky for us at the moment is that we don't yet have enough research to kind of explain these mechanisms and tell us um, what's helpful. <laughs> There's some really helpful work that's come out of um, come out of Leicester that's looked at the positive impact of exercise post COVID. And we've also seen uh, papers that talk about exercise intolerance uh, and deconditioning not explaining that as well. So I think the question is, firstly, what's important to the patient? Is exercise something that they care about doing? Um, and then the next thing is about the stability of the symptoms. So if I have somebody in front of me who's got very unstable symptoms, lots of boom and bust, exercise that is not the right thing for them at that moment. If you've got somebody who has achieved a bit more stability, has broken that boom and bust cycle, you can begin to think about adding some exercise into their rehabilitation, but it needs to be titrated. So it needs to be targeted in the right way, symptoms monitored, and also choosing something that they can tolerate. So often people will talk about things like supine exercise or swimming or something that they can tolerate to begin with. So, and, and lastly, it needs to be supported. Okay, telling people to just exercise their way out of their exercise intolerance is not going to end well. So uh, again, you've seen, some of, you've seen some of this data, I think on Mel's slides earlier, but just to share, so my expertise is in breathing pattern retraining, and we are running a breathing pattern retraining virtual group for our post-COVID patients. Um, and just to share, so actually the graphs at the top was um, virtual breathing pattern retraining one-to-one. -one. So we were able to demonstrate an improvement in their dyspnea 12 breathlessness score and in their BPAT. So right in the middle of that first wave, and we weren't seeing that many people face to face, that was quite reassuring for us as clinicians that what we were doing was actually making people better. Um, but we've now also rolled that out as a group. Uh, and that's a six week program that has breathing pattern retraining, some fatigue management, some psychological health advice, um, and most importantly, has the peer support. So it's eight to 10 people on a group. They do six sessions over 12 weeks. Um, and we are been, again able to demonstrate an improvement in their BPAT in their dyspnea 12 and in their fatigue assessment scale. And in a place where with long COVID, it's really quite hard to prove outcomes and to kind of show what's working and what's, what isn't, it's actually really reassuring to show that what we've been doing with our patients is helping them. And just on this, so in terms of kind of resources, so we're just about to launch, they might also, they might already be on YouTube, but we're about to do a launch around some breathing pattern retraining videos uh, on YouTube. So you can find post your patients to those. Um, and, uh, you know, I think as, you know, as Charles said, if you've got somebody who's got really dysfunctional breathing, you know, self-directed um, approach might, might fall short, uh, but it's definitely a good place to start getting them going with some initial breathing pattern work. 
So an invitation to clinicians in the room. So our uh, London Allied Health and Therapies Long COVID Network um, meets fortnightly on a Tuesday morning. Uh, and we set this up last year uh, when we had lots of clinicians working in services, really loads of clinical uncertainty. We don't really know what works. We need some peer support. Um, and our aims here in this group are sharing emerging clinical experience and innovation, ensuring we're up to date with policy um, and system updates, and then being able to contribute to the evidence base and to the guidance. So if you would like to join our distribution list, then please do. But the other thing that this space has been really lovely for has been hearing from people about what's what on the ground, what are the problems and what do we need to try and support. But we've also been able to pull together a consensus document, which again, we're hoping to release in the next few weeks um, that guide the principles of rehabilitation. So it's not just about the what, but it's the how. So the key things that this um, document is going to talk about. Uh, so up, as you can see up on the slide, so kind of engaging with people, uh, how we triage and assess properly, how we treat and manage, what we need to do to support our staff in terms of their competencies, care coordination, which has been kind of a recurring theme that you've heard this afternoon is being really important. And then how we support discharge from services, because again, that's a really tricky area in a, in a you know, condition that might turn out to be a long-term condition that's certainly got fluctuate, fluctuating nature. So just a couple of minutes uh, on the case study. Whistle stuff of rehab. So, um, just bringing it back to the case study that we've uh, that you've kind of had running throughout the day. So, for this individual, uh, key looking at assessment would be to be ruling out those uh, red flags that we've talked about. I'd also want to be thinking about asthma control because we're definitely seeing some people who have had COVID whose asthma control flares. So, being able to do a phenome in clinic is really helpful. Tells you what their control is like. I would absolutely be looking at their breathing pattern. Uh, and for those people who are not kind of experts in assessing breathing pattern, the pack would be quite a nice screening tool and I'm glad you disclosed the uh, conflict of interest there as well because I'm biased about it being helpful um, and then also psychological risk is something we've really had to think about in this group you know these are people whose uh, kind of function and uh, things they've been able to do in life have basically been taken away overnight uh, and for a lot of people that's traumatic so assessing for psychological risk uh, just to check that people are not kind of nearing that breaking point is really important um, so for this lady what matters to her you know in the case study, you can see you know, her role as a child, her role as a mother, uh, her role as a nurse. You know, she's got her child's needs to juggle as well. Um, it could be her financial security and it could also be being believed. It's really hard when people can't see anything wrong with you uh, for them to understand that you're struggling. And then in terms of her rehab offer, so again, it being multifaceted. So in NCL, we've started to use personal health budgets to support people. Uh, so for this lady, you know, that's something that will be worth exploring. Is there a personal health budget that can fund some childcare so it can mean that she can activity manage and pace properly and not be having to run around after a child, which could then have a positive impact on her on her rehab thinking about activity management. So whether that's using diaries, whether that's looking at pacing teaching her how to identify triggers, uh, not to push herself. Psychological support, clearly there's a lot of trauma going on here as well. And how can we support her psychological health alongside her physical health? Thinking about vocational rehab, can we engage with her employer and make that return to work um, when it's the right time, happen successfully rather than failing as we often see. Um, We'd offer her some breathing pattern retraining if her breathing pattern was disordered and trying to get her some peer support because a lot of people don't know anybody else with long COVID. Um, and so can we can we get some support there? So that was a whistle stop, a rehabilitation. Questions come in that you've gone on to answer within it. So, Excellent. one was um, how do they how do they join the network? Yeah, uh, which we've seen, and actually we need to be able to. We've already popped that one in the chat. <laughs> Another one is that the website that was being talked about before about breathing disorders. Is there anything available for children? Interesting. So I don't know, but I can find out. Perfect. Yeah, I think that, uh, and I don't know, Charles, whether you have any thoughts, but I feel like. If I was teaching the basics of breathing pattern training, I'd probably be starting in a similar place in terms of exercises. And so maybe that's a good starting point. Um, but I don't know about specifically written literature and support for breathing patterns disorder with children. Lovely. Yeah, Charlotte so Wells might be developing something. Yeah. In development. Mm. Mm. 
There was a last question asking about the criteria for the red flags. So don't talk. Uh, just to say, uh, have a look, World Physiotherapy Briefing Paper. Lovely. Thank you very much. Fantastic.